Tonight, Wellesley police are looking for potential surveillance video after a rash of break-ins in the area. Police say thieves got into three homes on Garden Road, Sawyer Road, and Hawthorne Road early yesterday morning. The homeowners in each break-in were home at the time. The suspects got in through unlocked doors and unlocked windows. Police say they're taking this extremely seriously and they need people to stay vigilant. The recurring theme among the victims in this in these situations are that the houses have been left unlocked, specifically unlocked doors, unlocked windows. So we're just trying to emphasize to all of our residents, please lock your doors, lock your car doors. If you have an alarm, use it. If you utilize cameras, please uh, use them. If you see something, call us immediately. Police say the suspects took several wallets, purses, and money. If you have any information, you're asked to call Wellesley Police. Morning, good to see you. Um, well, that might seem like a weird introduction uh, to a, a sermon uh, this morning, uh, but it actually has a point. And the point is this. I'll get to the point right off the, right off the bat here. You could say that these folks who went to bed with their doors unlocked and their windows open, you could say <clears throat> that, in a manner of speaking, they roll out a welcome mat for the perpetrators, right? I mean, they didn't do anything to prevent uh, the people from coming in. That works naturally, but that works uh, spiritually too. You could say uh, in a very real sense that they gave the perpetrators a foothold, and that works spiritually. We see that in Ephesians chapter 4. Don't let sin, or don't let, ang don't, don't sin by letting anger control you. Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry, for anger gives the devil a foothold. So anger isn't really the problem. The problem is going to bed while you're still angry, and we could talk about that in and of itself, but that's not our topic today. The point of all that is this, is that when you and I go to bed without resolving anger, that we're leaving the door open or the window open, much like these homeowners did. And then the enemy has access uh, to our lives. So we're gonna pray about, or we're gonna uh, pray in just a second, but we're gonna look at open access that we sometimes allow the enemy, um, certainly not purposely, although once you see it, you'll see that sometimes it is purposeful, but even more than that, more insidious than that, that it's not purposeful. It just happens and you don't even think about it. Let's pray and we'll continue on. Well, Lord, this morning we thank you for uh, the opportunity to gather here and worship your name, uh, that we live in a place and a time and a place when we can still do that freely. We can still lift up uh, the name of Jesus publicly and proclaim you as Lord, Savior and Lord, and we can worship you. And we can say publicly that in him we live and we move and we have our being. And so this morning as we uh, proclaim your name, as we continue uh, this series and wrap this series up today, uh, my prayer is this, Lord, is that uh, you would push back the powers of the enemy that want to interfere with what we're gonna do, what we're gonna say today. We know that many of us come here today with uh, apprehension, some come with fear, some dealing with anxiety, some dealing with uh, generational things from their family, things that just been kinda uh, taking a piggyback ride with them for years and years and years. Some come this morning uh, maybe apprehensively, some come uh, begrudgingly, maybe somebody brought them they don't really want to be here, but they said, okay. Lord, whatever all that is, we pray that you would push it out. We use the authority of your name, Jesus, uh, to say darkness has to stay outside this room, has to stay away from everybody here, everybody listening online, so that your name can be proclaimed. The truth can go out uh, and provide freedom for all who listen. We pray all that in Jesus' name, amen. Well, as I mentioned, this is the end of our uh, series on My Dear Wormwood. If you've never read uh, that book um, by C.S. Lewis, take a look at that sometime. It's interesting. Um, but let me say this. I'm not going to say anything today that you haven't already heard. You haven't probably already heard in your life as a believer. I'm certainly not going to say anything you haven't heard the last three weeks. Uh, what I hope to accomplish today is to maybe put an exclamation point on what you've already heard or provide some different ways to see what we've already talked about. And maybe that'll, that'll help you see something that, that uh, up to today you haven't quite been on board with. 
And so that's what I hope to accomplish today. So we talk about the reality of spiritual warfare first, and Jason talked about this on week one. Here's what C.S. Lewis says in his book. Go to our next slide there. There you go. He says there are two equal and opposite errors into which one can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive uh, interest in them, unhealthy interest in them. And you know what? Either way you go, the enemy's fine with that. You can obsess over, uh, there's a devil, there's a demon, there's some sort of spiritual thing around every corner. There's a boogeyman out to get you all the time. Enemy's fine with that. You can go clear over here and say, that was for the dark ages. That is over with. Jesus died on the cross and took care of all that, and he did. But that, no, we don't do with that. We don't mess with that stuff. And the enemy's fine with you thinking that way too. So if you don't believe in the reality of spiritual warfare, uh, first of all, I wonder, are you living on planet Earth uh, in 2022? Because uh, I am, and it's real. But let me give you a, a few ways to demonstrate how real spiritual warfare is. I mentioned this um, last week when, when we had the panel discussion in Pleasant Hill. There's 2,000 years of church history where if you go back, all the church fathers, you look at kind of a who's who of church fathers all the way back from now back to when Jesus was walking the earth, all church history records uh, instances of uh, focus on spiritual warfare. Not just a focus on it, but uh, in the catechism, if you were involved in a catechumen, you were a catechumen in there, you were required to go through deliverance because they believed that, re that strongly in the reality of spiritual warfare. Our own namesake, Wesley, uh, was one of those people who would involve people in uh, deliverance sessions. And so while church history is not the end authority, it's a pretty good track record. It, it tells you something. I'll get to the end authority in just a second. But um, so if you don't believe in, in spiritual warfare, let me tell you who does, okay? The enemy believes in spiritual warfare. You may not believe he's real. Don't worry. You don't have to worry about it. He believes he's real. He knows he's real. He knows what Jesus says. He knows that Jesus says his, uh, his mission statement is to kill, steal, and destroy. He believes in him. Now, if you uh, feel up to it and you want to climb into a ring with Mike Tyson and you see Mike Tyson and you go, wow, now that I'm standing here, the guy's 5'10". He's not that big. He's a couple hundred pounds. He's a heavyweight champ of the world, really? I, I'm not sure I believe that Mike Tyson can do this. You don't have to worry about it because Mike Tyson believes he can do it and he'll, he'd be glad to show you. And so if you don't believe in the enemy, the enemy believes in the enemy. When I was uh, just out of college, I took my very first business trip and just out of college and it was gonna be a couple days away and I was going to a city I'd never been before and I was gonna be all by, my, I was all by myself and I didn't know anybody there and I was going to be there a couple days, and it was a city that we really never had much to do with. Um, this is kind of a one-off deal. And I thought, this is kind of cool. I'm going to the city. Nobody knows me. I don't know anybody. I can do whatever I feel like doing and come home, and nobody will know a thing. And I had in mind something that I wanted to do. And the whole day while I'm traveling, I'm thinking of this. I'm thinking, okay, I've never been there, but I can probably just kind of logistically putting this together in my head. <clears throat> and when I got there and I got settled, I didn't have to go look for anything. You know why? It came to me. I was blown away. This exact thing that I was thinking of, these things I was thinking of all day, came right to me, right in my hand. And I said I was, uh, um, there was a group of people and I said out loud, under my breath, so only I could hear it, but out loud, I said, Satan's real. Satan's real. That is crazy that I was thinking this, traveling here today, and here it is. And I grew up believing that God was real, and the devil was real, whatever that meant. I didn't, you know, quantify either one of those or think much about him. Uh, so I already believed that the devil was real, again, generically. But on that day, at that time, I experienced He's real. This, this is crazy. That didn't stop me from doing what I wanted to do, but, but I understood then that he is real. So we've got a couple thousand years of church history that says spiritual warfare is real. We've got uh, church fathers 
We got the enemy who says spiritual warfare is real. You got Bob who says it's real. You could probably verify that, but let's take it to a higher authority than, than any of that, okay? Let's take it to the ultimate authority. Let's go to what Jesus says, John chapter eight. He, Satan, was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he's a liar and the father of lies. When I was a brand new Christian, I was talking about this with a pastor friend of mine. A guy was discipling me, and you've probably heard this saying applied to other situations, but he said, um, I said, well, how do I know when something, you know, is, is truth or the lie? And he said, well, if the enemy's lips are moving, it's a lie. So I'll just, that's kind of the easy way to do it, right? Yeah, he's a liar and the father of lies. Everything he says is a lie. It's easy to identify, easy to identify. So the Bible really boils down to this in this next slide. Here's what the Bible boils down to. Got another slide there. All right, well, the Bible boils down to this. Uh, there's a real spiritual warfare, there we go, thank you. There's a real spiritual warfare, but Jesus wins every single time. Jesus conquers, so we don't have to worry about it. And by extension, if you're in Christ, if you know him as Savior and Lord, you win too. In fact, you don't just conquer, Romans says you're more than a conqueror through Christ. So spiritual warfare is real. We don't need to sweat it, though. Don't need to be afraid of it because we're on the winning side. We've already seen that one way to invite in uh, this warfare, the, the enemy, is by going to bed without resolving anger. Here's another one. Here's a massive one that doesn't get thought of uh, a lot. And, and Lewis mentions this in his book, and it's pride. It's pride. Here's what he says uh, to his uh, protege, Wormwood. He says, you're patient, or the Christian has become humble. Have you drawn his attention to the fact? All virtues are less formidable to us once the man is aware that he has them, but this is especially true of humility. In other words, hey, Wormwood, this little devil in training, hey, Wormwood, your client, the Christian, he's starting to become humble. He's starting to kind of shed himself and look a little more like Jesus. He's really displaying humility. Why don't you get him focused on that so he can become prideful, okay? Any wrestling fans here? Not, not the kind of wrestling Jason watches on Friday night on TNT, but real wrestling, like Dan Gable. Um, a reversal's worth two points, and that's what is trying to happen here. We're gonna revert, do a reversal and get a couple points. We're gonna, he's getting humo, humble, but we're gonna try to make him prideful in his humility. Gain a couple points. But in the spiritual realm in life, it's worth more than a couple points. It's worth our entire life. And so here's a great illustration from scripture of the value of humility, the value that God puts on humility and how he pushes away pride. We'll look at a couple kings from uh, the history of Israel, first two kings actually, and we've got Saul and we've got David. And I won't bother telling you all about them. You, you know generally their background and everything about them. Here we've got Saul whose sin was he spared the lives of some sheep and some cattle. He was told to wipe out the Amalekites, kill everything. And he said, I will do as the Lord says. And he goes and he kills almost everything, but he spares some, some cattle and some sheep. And we've got David, David with his sin with Bathsheba. The Bible says in the spring of the year when the kings, you know, go out to war, the weather's turning, we're out of the mud and the cold, we can get back to war. The kings would go out to war, but David didn't, so he's complacent. He's lust, he's involved in adultery, he lies about this, there's manipulation. He gets um, Bathsheba's husband back from the front lines and tries to manipulate him into sleeping with his wife so it looked like he's the father of this child now. Uh, can't, that doesn't work, so he has, has him murdered. Uh, and then he lives in secret. He sits on this sin, <clears throat> all this for at least nine months because this child is born, so he's just kind of sitting on all this. And so humanly speaking, again, we're thinking about uh, humility versus pride, humanly speaking, on the scales of justice, which one of these would weigh heavier? Wouldn't you think David, just humanly speaking, David's sin weighs heavier? You go, man, that, that guy needs to do some time. Uh, Saul, eh, it's sheep, it's cattle, who cares about that? But God doesn't see it like that. Let me read to you what he says. This is from 1 Samuel 15, and the heading of this, this chapter is, the Lord rejects Saul as king. 
1 Samuel, 1 Samuel 15. Early in the morning, Samuel got up and went to meet Saul, and he was told, Saul has gone to Carmel. There he has set up a monument in his own honor. Can we have the next slide? That will show this. Uh, okay. Uh, there he has set up a monument in his own honor and has turned and gone on down to Gilgal. When Samuel reached him, Saul said, listen to this, Saul said to him, the Lord bless you. I've done as the Lord commanded. When Samuel reached him, uh, or when Sa then Samuel said, what then is the bleeding of sheep in my ears? What is the lowing of cattle that I hear? And he went on and on. And if you fast forward through this, Story finally to, I think, verse yeah, 24, you finally get to where Samuel, or Saul says to Samuel, I've sinned. I've violated the Lord's command and your instructions. So he kind of, not kind of, he very much tap dances around things. Have you ever known anybody, have you ever been the person who when you were confronted with something, you had 50 excuses it was this person's fault. See, that person made me do it. They convinced me I didn't want to, but I kind of went with them. And see, I got, I've got all these reasons why it's not me. I'm not responsible. Yes, I was part of it, but it's, it's not ultimately on me. I've got all the excuses in the world. And finally, maybe finally, I get to, you know, yeah, I mean, I was part of it. It, it was me, sort of, but it was really them. And if you look at David, here's what, God says about David, this is uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12. So the prophet Nathan comes to David and he tells David this story. And I won't read it to you, but you can read it in, in chapter 12. <clears throat> and the story in a nutshell is there was a poor man who had this little lamb and he cared for it like his daughter. Uh, and somebody came and took it from him and killed it and offered it. And, you know, that's, that's in general in the story. So I'll pick it up and start reading here. Um, oops. In the next chapter, and it says, David burned with anger. So Nathan's telling him this story. Nathan, or David burned with anger against the man and said to Nathan, as surely as the Lord lives, the man who did this must die. He must pay for that lamb four times over because he did such a thing and had no pity. Then Nathan said to David, you're the man. You're the man, David. The story that I just told you, you're the man in the story. You're the one who's guilty. You're the one who's responsible. And right off the bat, doesn't even appear to bat an eye, David said to Nathan, I've sinned against the Lord. And I love the specificity with which David confesses. And he follows that up in Psalm 32 and Psalm 51. Not only I've sinned, but I've sinned against the Lord. He follows that up in the Psalms. I've sinned against you, meaning God. Against you, you only have I sinned. And so we look at David, who forever is known as the man after God's heart, and we look at Saul, who forever is known as the first king of Israel, but the one from whom God pulled the throne, and we look at their sins, and boy, they sure seemed uh, incongruent there, but we look at where they are now, this is why. This is exactly why. Because God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And humble people like David say, I've sinned against the Lord. That's it. That's the end of the story. I've sinned against the Lord. That's James chapter 4. God opposes the proud and he gives grace to the humble. Here's what Jim Simbola from Brooklyn Tabernacle says about that on the next slide. Yeah, he says, God is attracted to weakness. This is a rich, rich truth. God is attracted to weakness. He can't resist those who humbly and honestly admit how desperately they need him. It's like God just can't restrain himself when somebody just admits, I'm guilty, I've, I've done it. God just rushes to meet them. God is opposed to the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. He rushes to meet them. Andrew Murray says this in his book, Humility. I read this years ago. He says, humility is the only soil in which the graces grow. Humility is is the only soil in which the grace is grown. When we read that, we get it. If you, you're a gardener, yeah, you get that. There's more to it than meets the eye, though. It's kind of a play on words because the Latin word for humility is humus. And if you're a gardener, you know what humus is, right? You know, that's that good, rich, dark, moist soil. You plant about anything in it, and it's going to grow. It's just, it's made for growing. And what Murray is, is saying 
quoting really what God says about giving grace to the humble, is when we're humble, our lives re represent good, rich soil in which God can grow, can, can uh, display his grace in our lives. Isn't that good? That, that was worth the price of admission this morning right there, wasn't it? That's just good stuff. That's just good stuff. So humility restricts the enemy's access, whereas pride welcomes it in. Here's what welcoming it in looks like. Here's what welcoming uh, pride in looks like. And we don't mean to do that. The Lord showed me this just last summer. I was uh, all by myself and I was praying, I was thinking about something, and uh, this certain part of my life uh, from the past, and the Lord, uh, just, just this image came to my mind of a door, and I thought, yeah, man, that's, that thing's been an open door in my life. And it was as if, I didn't hear anything, it was as if the Lord said, yeah, a door is kind of the way to put it, Bob. It's more like this. It's more like a stinking hanger door. You can give out anything through that door. And when we're prideful, when we go to bed without resolving anger, we'll talk about a couple other ways, sometimes that represents a massive door through which the enemy has access to our lives. We can pray all we want, but as long as the door is open, the enemy can still come in and out. Well, another way we provide a foothold uh, is by not praying. And I won't spend much time on that because hopefully that's very obvious, but here's what Samuel says. He says to the people, uh, Samuel 12, 1 Samuel 12, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by ceasing to pray for you. Samuel knew and equated lack of prayer with sinning against the Lord. And if I don't pray, I'm allowing the enemy uh, potentially an open door that he can, uh, through which he can affect me. Jesus says this, Matthew 26, watch and pray so you'll not fall into temptation. Watch and pray so you don't fall into temptation. Be purposeful about prayer. Be very specific about it, very purposeful. Well, Paul outlines a lot of other ways in Galatians 5, and I made another slide about that. I won't read the whole verse, but there's all these other pretty obvious ways that we allow the enemy access. We roll out the red carpet for him, sexual immorality and idolatry and uh, quarreling, jealousy, angry outbursts, division. I love this at the end. He's very, very thorough in his list. It's almost as if he says, well, and I know you can get creative with lots of other things, and so I'm just going to put them all under the like. So if there's anything not on the list that you tend to go to, it's probably under the like. There's ways that we invite uh, the enemy in. Those are all pretty obvious things, but here's the last thing. The last thing's a lot less obvious. You know, God's word says this. He says that our enemy, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And there's two, two parts to that. There's the obvious part. There, there's this roaring lion. You know, if, if you see a roaring lion, you're probably going to back off. If you're smart, you're going to back off. But the other part of that we don't always see, and that's the prowling about part. Before the lion starts to roar, he prowls about, kind of hides in the weeds and hangs out in the background and, and stalks you. And that's what sin does sometimes. And so what I want to talk about next is a, a, a particular thing that hides in the weeds that, that's a little more insidious and we don't always see. And that's just the things that we believe, the paradigms that we have, the things that we believe, the things we carry with us from our family, from way in the back. And we don't even have any way of thinking of that. It doesn't even come to our mind. And maybe, maybe there are things, belief systems that you have that do come to mind and you're tired of it. Maybe the things that... you can't even imagine right now, but the Lord wants to put his hand on those things. And so there's a lot of ways, a lot of beliefs and a lot of values he wants to get to. It's things we believe and we take them as the gospel. They're true to us, may not be true to anybody else, but the way I grew up, the things I've been through in life, they're, they're true to me. But here's a caution. There's a whole theology that says that when Jesus died on the cross, all that stuff was under the blood. He took it to the cross. It's under the blood. And that's true. That's true. Then be, that is true. So I'm not dumbing that down. That is true. So explain to me why uh, Don's in business. <laughs> All this stuff's under the blood. Explain to me why Teen Challenge has been 
going for all these years. We got people, most people who come to our place already know the Lord. Some of them are raised in pastors' homes, but they're coming with all kinds of addictions, all kinds of strongholds in their life. It's already under the blood. Explain why, you know, all kinds of things like that uh, are necessary when it's all under the blood already. Here's the truth that your past becomes your present and it will become your, re- your future unless you hit the brakes and take a look at it. And you can only do that with other people. And that, doesn't, that doesn't happen alone because you and I have a, have a way of uh, being delusional on our own. I'll leave you out of it. I have a way of deluding myself, okay? But I bet you do too. Okay. So we need, we need uh, groups. We need people to help us do that. Here's what Paul says, 1 Corinthians 13. He says, when I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me. I just asked the people in Pleasant Hill what I'm about to ask you. And when I asked this question, all over the place, people went, mm-hmm, yep. Some of them looked at each other and went, yep. Here's the question. Do you know any uh, 50-year-olds who are 13-year-olds? Yeah, sure you do. I mean, that's not to put those people down. That's not to call names or anything. It's just, yeah, of course, all kinds of them, all over the place. Some of them are CEOs of companies. Some are physicians. Some of them are flying planes, you know, all kinds of things, all over the place. Whether they realize it or not, there's something there. Every year when I renew my Sirius XM subscription, their big selling point is, hey, you can get three channels of this certain talk show host. And every year I think to myself, why do I want one channel of a 12-year-old, 68-year-old talk show host? No, I don't want that. Vulgar, you know. Don't want that. So, yeah, you probably know people like that. Maybe you've been that. Maybe, uh, again, it's, it's not a put-down. We're just into reality here. Maybe as you sit here this morning, as you watch online, Maybe that is you, and you're aware enough to say, yeah, I'm, I'm stuck somewhere at some point. Your past becomes your present, and it'll become your future unless you deal with it. Here's a scriptural example of how that works. We've got, and we just read this a couple weeks ago we, in the book of Numbers, we've got uh, the nation of Israel coming out of 430 years of slavery After 430 years of slavery, don't you begin to think a certain way about yourself, about your people, about who you are, what you're worth, and what you can accomplish, what you can't accomplish, about the the parameters in your life that are pretty tight? Yeah. And they come, and they're going to send 12 spies to to find this promised land and spy it out and make sure, you know, just kind of get the lay of the land. And 10 of them come back, and they reveal something that they smuggled out of Egypt that the Bible doesn't say in black and white, but you see it. It says in black and white, they took their uh, kneading troughs and their clothing and their animals and their families. They took all these things. They plundered the Egyptians and they took all this stuff out of Egypt with them. Here's another thing they took out of Egypt with them in Numbers 13 that you see it crystal clear. It says this, Numbers 13, verse 33. We went in and they were talking to the the inhabitants of this, this promised land and said, we seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes. And we look the same to them. That's a belief about who I am, whose I am, what he can do through me, what, we're all, what our people are about. We're grasshoppers. Nope, grasshoppers belong in Egypt. We're going back. That leads to the wandering. That's the value, or I should say the negative value of a paradigm, of a, a deeply seated belief system that I'm sure they never even thought of until they hit that point in their lives in Numbers 13. We are grasshoppers. Grasshoppers have no business taking the land of promise. One of the things I like to do when we have a, a wellspring session is I like to throw, um, well, I don't like to throw anything. It's not dramatic. Um, I like to uh, launch, we'll call it launching, depth charges. You know what depth charges are? Depth chargers are what gets launched off of a battleship uh, in a time of war, and we think there might be enemy activity underwater here, submarines, but we don't know for sure, so we're just going to launch these depth charges. And if there's something down there, it'll tell us, and our goal ultimately is to get that thing to come to the surface and to surrender. And one of the things that happens in a freedom session is, uh, when I'm leading a freedom session, is the discerners will hand me notes about things that, that... they feel the Lord is saying, 
And I start to put those together and they all start to add up. And so I'll ask the person being prayed for, just ask them questions. Hey, let me ask you a few questions. These may or may not resonate. You may, I may ask something that doesn't connect with you at all, and that's fine. Uh, but we may find a submarine. That submarine will be a deeply held belief or something uh, under the surface of the water. We want to get that thing to the surface. Uh, and it is powerful what the Lord does. It's powerful. When the light goes off and people sit there and they go, yeah, man, and I, I'm speaking from experience having been in that chair being prayed for as a believer who's been in ministry for going on 27 years and I'm sitting in the chair and the lights are going off. I'm like, okay, this is good, I think. Yeah, it's good stuff. All right. So let me say this, especially to the men, okay, because I know this is always a concern. We don't do this. We don't look for submarines under the, ask the Holy Spirit to show us uh, submarines under the ground because we want to commiserate about our past, blame somebody, talk about our childhood and, and uh, woe is me and, you know, I'm poor and feel bad for me and I feel bad. None of that. That none of that. We don't want to do that. What we want to do is we want to get that submarine, if possible, to the surface so that you can own it and say, yep, just like David, yep, and I surrender this to you, Lord. I give this to you. That's not commiserating. That's moving away from, that's moving on from this thing, resolving it. And so what do you believe about spiritual warfare? What do you believe about spiritual warfare? Kind of still thinking, eh, it's in the past, it's not really real. I tell this story, uh, I'll tell you very briefly, when we do a freedom session, as when I introduce myself, I tell people, when I was a brand new Christian, and I needed to pray uh, for myself, I prayed these spiritual warfare prayers, just, man, driving the enemy out. And I was sitting, I'm a brand new Christian, I'm sitting at a stoplight one day, and, and I'm praying, against the enemy on some certain things and it's not it's just it's a struggle and this car pulls up next to me and I'm just frustrated and I say I say Lord take these these thoughts now and um, put them in that guy's head and I drove on down the road and a couple blocks later I thought that eh, probably isn't probably very cool yeah I probably shouldn't have done that I thought, you know, I'm going to get home tonight, I'm going to turn the news on, and they're going to say, so a guy was driving down the road and just unexplainably veered off, and he crashed into a telephone pole, and nobody knows why, and I'd have to call the police and go, I know why, because, you know. Um, anyway, um, is it real? Do you believe spiritual warfare is real? Like I said, if you live and breathe uh, in this day, uh, you have a lot of evidence in front of you, whether you acknowledge it or not, uh, that spiritual warfare is real. The enemy really is out to kill and steal and destroy. But whatever you believe, what's it based on? Is it based on God's word? Is it based on the movies that you like to watch, the music you like to listen to, your favorite podcast, talk show host, your friend, your group of friends, your whatever your news out, favorite news outlet is? What's your view of spiritual warfare and what's it based on? If it's based on anything other than what God says, it's, it's, that's not the right foundation. That's not the right foundation. We need to filter what we receive. Test the spirits, God says, to see whether they're from God. Here's what Proverbs 4 says. Proverbs 4 says, above all else, guard your heart. Guard what you and I, we need to guard what we allow in, who we have allow to have access to our heart, because everything we do flows out of it. Whether I realize it or not, it might be conscious, it might be subconscious, but everything I do flows out of what I believe, out of what's in here, good, bad, or otherwise, and the same with you. So how is your heart? Are you granting access to the enemy? Is there some way that the enemy has access to you? Ask the worship team if you'd come, if you would, please. You know, a lot of people live with an open door policy. It looks like this. Put up that next picture. A lot of people live like that without meaning to, without really realizing it. Doors open, enemy can come in. They grant access by what they read and watch and listen to, by who they interact with the most. Take in whatever might seem like truth for the day, uh, but it's not God's truth. 
or it's a variation, but it's really not God's truth. But here's a caution in all this process. It's not about you. See, if there's submarines under the surface and surrendering them to the Lord, it does, it does affect you, it does involve you, but it's ultimately not about you. It's ultimately about Jesus and him being expressed through our lives. And one of the, the ways I get to express him, I get to tell you about all the crap in my life and how the Lord has dealt with it or is dealing with it. So it's not about me. I mean, I certainly wouldn't get up here and tell you this stuff on my own, but it's about him. He gets to be made famous through all that. So it's not about you, though it does involve you. So what windows and doors are open? What do you need to surrender to him? Here's something a pastor told me when I was, I wasn't even a Christian yet. I was so brand new. I was just talking to this guy and he was a bullet head for Jesus. Just hair on fire for Jesus all the way. And that was kind of cool. I, I thought, ah, good for you, man. That's awesome. Good for you. Um, whatever. And he was sharing Christ with me and I said to them, they used this exact phrase, I said, you know what, man? I just want balance. I, I just want balance. I don't want to be like you. That's good for you, but I don't want to be like that. Um, I don't want to be like I am anymore for all these years, but I'm not, not into that. Just give me balance. And he didn't even miss a beat. He said, nope, no way. He said, balance is going to kill you. Balance will kill you. The conditions for surrender are the same conditions Roosevelt applied to the Axis powers in World War II. Two words, unconditional surrender. We make no deals. We don't cut any new treaties. It's unconditional surrender. And so if you have open doors, open windows, those are the conditions. Just surrender. Just completely surrender. Abandon yourself to what the Lord wants to do. I ask you to stand with me as we finish. So who does this apply to? Well, it applies to every one of us. But let me get more specific. If you are a pornography consumer, it applies to you. You got a massive opening, like a hangar door open that the enemy can come in. And even if you pray, even if you love Jesus, even if you read your Bible, if you consume pornography in whatever form, watching it, reading it, listening to it, um, none of the above, but you just think about it because your brain can replay things, uh, fantasize, You've got a massive opening. You've rolled out the red carpet, whether you meant to or not. If you like to use alcohol just to take the edge off after a rough day, I'm not talking about having a drink with dinner, being legalistic or anything like that. I'm just talking about I use alcohol, if you use alcohol, to take the edge off or just to numb things out, just to chill for a little bit, that's an opening. You're giving the enemy an opening through which he can come into your life. If you read your Bible through in a year, but you do those things, or maybe those, those things are pretty obvious, maybe you continue to hold on to a belief that in this instance in my past, in this person, I am right and they were wrong. It was 20 years ago, but by golly, they were wrong and I was right. You're holding on to that, you've got an opening in your life. And the enemy would be glad to come, is glad to come in and out of that, that opening. And so, you want to surrender that without meaning to that rolls out the red carpet that puts the welcome mat out and says come on in now you can do the opposite you can serve him eviction notice and say you're gone you're done no more i'm closing this door specifically purposely in my life you have no more access your mission statement against me to kill steal and destroy it's canceled done i can live in freedom and then I can tell people about Jesus with conviction, with power, with authority, 